In the last video, we learned what the Bitcoin blockchain data structure is. Now let's learn how we can replicate that from one computer to another to achieve a consensus between those computers. A quick review of what consensus is. If we have a bunch of computers, we can divide those computers into good computers and bad computers. Our good computers are doing what we expect and running our consensus algorithm. Our bad computers are doing arbitrarily bad things, and we shouldn't care what they do. If our consensus algorithm works, they aren't going to mess us up. And a consensus is formed when all of the good computers agree upon and use a single blockchain. In the last video, we learned that if two computers can agree upon just a single block, the head block in your blockchain, you can then iterate through all of the blocks in the blockchain and verify that the rest of it is identical. Therefore, forming consensus is just a matter of agreeing upon a single block across our good computers. So this means that consensus really only is agreeing upon one block and replicating it across all of our good computers. How do you get a bunch of computers to agree on this block? Well, in previous videos, we've studied consensus algorithms such as Paxos, Raft, and PBFT, which let us get consensus between computers. Why don't we just use one of those? Now, an aside, we actually didn't study PBFT, which is practical Byzantine fault tolerance. We studied a Byzantine fault tolerant solution. PBFT just uses cryptography to make the solution slightly more efficient. The problem with using a traditional consensus algorithm for something like Bitcoin is that Bitcoin allows a computer to join or leave its network at any time. This is actually what they mean when they describe Bitcoin as being a public blockchain. It's open to the public. Traditional consensus algorithms like Paxos, Raft, and PBFT have an assumption, which is if you have one computer, you have one vote in the algorithm. So that means that if halfway through a round of the algorithm, a bunch of computers get up and leave, you may never achieve consensus because you don't have a majority of votes available to complete the algorithm. Even worse, if a bunch of computers join the network, then they may be able to just, if they're bad, swing the vote in arbitrary ways or stop your system from ever achieving consensus. And that's not a desirable property for something like Bitcoin. We, we want Bitcoin to be able to come to consensus on every round of the algorithm. Why is this a problem in reality? Well, if you have one computer, one vote, we don't know whether a computer is real or whether it's a virtual machine, and an attacker could spawn a potentially infinite number of virtual machines to just totally mess with the system. And that would be bad because we want our system to work. Bitcoin needs an algorithm that is resistant to attackers who have access to virtual machine software. Let's figure this out. We're going to invent a new algorithm together, going step by step. We're going to start off with something fairly simple and then fix the bugs as we discover the bugs. And eventually we're going to redevelop the Bitcoin algorithm together. So what are our requirements? What do we need out of our new Bitcoin consensus algorithm? Well, when we generate a new block, that new block eventually needs to be replicated to all of the good nodes in our system. In other words, we need to be able to have a consensus. When an even newer block is generated, that needs to point to this new block. So our blockchain grows. It doesn't just get one block added and then stop. Nodes should be able to join or leave our system at any time while maintaining consensus and also without causing deadlock in our system. So we should be able to get consensus and have the system keep on working. And we also have to be network partition tolerant. Now, this is an unusual requirement because traditional consensus algorithms don't really tolerate partitions that well. They sort of either have a majority that works and the other portion doesn't, or they just stop if the partition is too bad. With the Bitcoin blockchain, we need each piece to keep on working because who knows, maybe it's a permanent partition in our network. And when the partition heals, when the two pieces of the network start being able to talk to each other again, the consensus should heal as well. And so that means that part of the network may come to one consensus and later change its mind when it joins a larger partition of the network and form a different consensus about what blockchain they're using. This is actually really weird. And if you look at this, you might say, well, that doesn't meet the traditional definition of a consensus algorithm because usually consensus algorithms terminate. And when they terminate, you know what the consensus is. Something like the Bitcoin blockchain is continuously iterating and it may at any time change what the agreed upon blockchain is. So is it a consensus algorithm, isn't it? 
Well, I'm going to say it is, but it's a weird and funky kind of consensus algorithm. So those are our requirements. Let's start trying to come up with an algorithm and see how it works. We'll start with the simplest thing possible, which is this. Step one, if you want to add a block to your blockchain, go ahead, just create a block. And once you've created a block, tell your neighbors, the other computers you know about, about the block you just added, which will replicate your block across those computers. And if you ever hear about a block, tell your neighbors about it too. So this is sort of like a gossip protocol. And so now whenever I add a block, it just gets replicated from one computer to another and eventually they all learn about it, right? This works. This works great as long as you have one node that is generating blocks and propagating them to all the other nodes in your network. Where it fails is if two nodes generate a block at the same time. Then what happens is, for example, here I have computer one and computer three generate a block at the same time, and then they start telling their neighbors about it, and their neighbors go, wait, 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 wait. I, I, I've just heard about two blocks that point to the same parent, so I no longer have a chain, I've got a block tree. Or in other words, we've forked our blockchain, and we now have two branches to our fork, which we need to figure out what are we gonna do about this? So what do we do when our blockchain forks? And this is a critical design decision. Well, since we're talking about doing the simplest thing possible, how about let's come up with a really simple solution. If you ever notice there's a fork in your blockchain and you wanna add a new block, what you should do is you should add your block to whatever the longest branch is. That's a simple rule. And if you have more than one branch at the same length, just pick it random. Doesn't matter, just pick something and do it. So let's say we do that. Well, what's gonna happen here? Computer one adds a new block to its a random branch of this fork, and it tells its neighbors about it, and that propagates to the network, and suddenly there's only one longest branch and one short branch. The short branch will never get another block added to it again, because it's not the longest branch and the long branch will continue to grow and we'll just have a blockchain with an abandoned branch off to the side. Great, so it's working again. We no longer have to worry about forks because they just healed themselves, right? Well, if only it was that simple. Let's consider another case. Let's consider the case where a branch has formed and then two different nodes are both eager to add a block to the blockchain. So they pick randomly and they add a block and then they start telling their neighbors about it, but the network is kind of slow. And so then they add another block to their longest branch and they tell their neighbors about it and they add another block and, wait a second. Now we have two different blockchains that are growing from two different parts in their network and it's never getting resolved. We're never going back to a single coherent consensus on what the single blockchain is. This isn't working so well. So why is it that our system is forming LiveLock? What's wrong with our algorithm? I'm actually gonna ask you to stop the video right now. Pause the video and think about what is the fundamental problem that is causing us to LiveLock? And when you come back, we'll discuss. what the problem is? The fundamental problem is that we can add blocks to a blockchain much faster than we can learn about other nodes adding blocks to our blockchain. Our individual computers are too fast compared to the communication time of our network between the computers. And so it pains me to say what the solution to this is because I'm a performance geek. I like to make systems as fast as possible, but the solution is we just need to slow the system down. If we slowly add blocks to our blockchain, then we'll hear about other nodes adding blocks before we can run off too far ahead and create our own independent blockchain independent of everyone else. So how do we do this in a principled way? Well, what we do is every time you wanna add a block, you sleep a random period of time and only once your timer expires, do you add your block. Let's explain this using an example. So if all of our computers have a fork that's been communicated between them, and we want to add another block to our blockchain, instead of just picking randomly and adding a block right away, the first thing we do is we set a timer. And we just wait and wait and wait. And once our timer expires, we're allowed to add a block, so we add a block. 
As soon as we add a block, we tell all of our neighbors about it. And when our neighbors hear about that new block from one of their peers, they immediately stop their timers and say, wait, I've got to add this block. Now I'm going to start a new timer and wait again. So we've solved the problem of forks that last forever, this live lock problem, by adding these timers. And the longer our timeouts, the more robust our system is against forks that last forever, right? They, they get resolved more quickly if we sleep longer. Wait, is that right? Well, let's, let, let's, let's plot this out and think about this. If we sleep longer, the system will take longer to reach consensus because it'll take longer to add a block to our system. But each time we add a block, it's more likely to quickly achieve consensus on that new block. So long timers are bad, right? Because they slow us down. But long timers are good because they decrease the number of forks. And there has to be an optimal point in the middle there. And as far as I know, the only way to really find that optimal point in a real system is experimentally. Try it out and see what works. You'll note that along the x-axis here, I'm showing the time until the first timer expires. If we have a lot of computers in our system, then it's going to be not that long before the first one expires because you've got a lot of timers that are all sleeping a random period of time. And the more computers you have, the sooner one of them is going to go off. So that means we need to adjust our timeouts to be higher as we add more computers to the system. Yet another knob that we've got to tweak in our system. You'll know that I'm talking about expected values here. How long do we expect it to take until the first timer expires? This is actually a probabilistic algorithm. We don't know whether any particular round of this algorithm will come to a consensus or result in a fork. But over time, as more and more rounds execute, eventually the current round will have a consensus across all the nodes in our system. And that's actually one of the cool properties of this algorithm, which makes it work as well as it does which is it takes time for the blockchain to heal into a single consensus chain across all the nodes, but once it does, it's very robust and, and it works. There's one problem we haven't considered yet, which is we've considered the problem of forming a consensus across our nodes. We've considered the problem of what do you do when you get a live lock and how do you solve that? We added the timers. But what about if our network has a partition? So for example here, if our three computers are working away, adding to their blockchains, and suddenly computers one and two can no longer talk to computer three, and computer three can't talk to computer one and two, we've got a network partition. What happens? Well, all of our nodes keep on running the algorithm as we've already defined it. They sit there waiting for their timeouts to expire, and when a timer expires, they just go ahead and add to their blockchain and tell all of the peers that they can talk to about it. Well, computer three never learns about the additions made by one and two and vice versa, but that's okay. The blockchains just continue to grow over time as the timeouts expire. Chances are computers one and two will be able to grow their blockchain faster because they have more computers. So their timeouts on average will be shorter. And once the partition heals, computer three will learn about all of these other blocks that were added by one and two, and it will just replicate those blocks over to computer three and the blockchain heals again. We now have one coherent blockchain and the branch formed by computer three is abandoned. Great. So what's left? What haven't we considered yet? Do we have a perfect algorithm yet? No. One thing we haven't talked about is how do you actually pick this timeout value? And the way that Bitcoin does this is it does it empirically. It just says on each node, it measures how often new blocks are arriving. And if new blocks arrive too often, where in Bitcoin world, that is more often than one block every 10 minutes, then it tries to slow the system down. And so the way that Bitcoin does this is once every roughly 14 days, it says, okay, are the blocks arriving too quickly? If so, I need to increase my timeouts and make the timers longer. And the whole system will do that at the same time because they're all running the same calculation. But then there's the other question, which is what happens if one of the computers is bad? What if it cheats? We haven't really discussed the bad case, right? And a bad computer in this algorithm could cheat simply by saying, oh, my timer expired, I get to add a block. My timer expired, I get to add a block. My timer expired, I get to add a block. And so if you have your timer expire super fast and you ignore the fact that you're supposed to be waiting longer, you can control the entire blockchain. And 
That's not a desirable thing in the Bitcoin world, especially since whoever gets to add to the blockchain gets paid money and everyone wants to get paid money, right? The question then becomes, how do you make a timer that is cheat resistant? Can you make a timer such that even a bad node, an evil person, cannot make the timer go off before its time? There's the elegant way of making a cheat resistant timer, which is you write some code that runs in a cheat resistant processor using cryptography and trusted computing modules. And that's actually a system that has been built. Uh, the Intel Sawtooth blockchain has been built with code that does this kind of trusted computing thing. And it uses the Intel SGX module to make sure that no one can mess with your code. And then you have to ask yourself the question, do you trust Intel to build truly unhackable hardware that can't be cheated in any way, shape or form? And I would love to say the answer is yes, but unfortunately, the trusted computing hardware is new enough that people have found vulnerabilities in it recently. And so the level of trust that most people have in this hardware to be truly resistant to a determined attacker is lower than I think you need it to be for something like a global spanning currency system. Kind of sad, but I wish it was different. It's the way it is. So then there's the other way of creating a cheat resistant timer, which is brute force. In other words, physics. Let's build a timer that no one can make go off too fast. And the way we do that is using a math problem. And so we need a math problem, which no one knows how to solve quickly. Whatever math problem we choose, it should be very easy and very fast to verify that you have the correct solution, even though it takes a long time to find that solution in the first place. So this approach is called proof of work. You want to give me a new block to add to the blockchain? Prove that you did a bunch of work before I'm going to accept it and add it to my copy of the blockchain. So how does proof of work work? Well, if you recall, a blockchain is a series of blocks and each block contains a cryptographic hash of the prior block. And since it's a cryptographic hash, it's very easy to compute what the hash of the prior block is, but it is virtually impossible to pick a hash and then generate a block that matches that hash because that's what cryptographic hashes are. They're hard to reverse functions. So let's say that it's only a valid block in our blockchain if it's a cryptographic hash and the first n digits of that hash, in this case, say four, are zeros. So now you've got to add something to the previous block that forces that hash to start with four zeros. How do you do that? Well, the only way that we know of in order to figure out a hash with four zeros is to just try a bunch of values. And so this value, which we insert in the previous block, we call it a nonce. And so you just have to try a nonce. Well, if I try a nonce of zero, will that generate a hash with four zeros? No. Crud. Okay, let's try one. Does that work? No. Okay, let's try two. Does that work? No. And so we can make it arbitrarily hard to create a nonce that causes this magic formula to work out by just increasing the number of zeros or the n in our algorithm required at the beginning of the hash of the next block. So if you want to add a block to your blockchain, you need to just sit there and try different nonces until you finally find one that works that will let you add a block to the blockchain. And the first computer to successfully find a nonce that works for their block gets to tell all the other computers in the world, hey, I generated a new block, here it is. And then they have to accept it because, hey, this person did the work and it's a valid block. And then they've got to start over because they're trying to chain off of that block. And so their timer resets automatically. So that's it. That is the Bitcoin blockchain consensus algorithm. If you want to add a block, you just go ahead, add a block and tell all your peers about it. But in order to make sure that you have a single coherent blockchain, you always add to the longest blockchain that you know of. And before you can add that block, you need to wait for your timer to expire. And the way you compute that timer is by guessing nonces until finally you've guessed one that causes the hash of that block to start with a number of zeros. That's the Bitcoin blockchain consensus algorithm. We've just reinvented it from scratch. And then the question is, is this a consensus algorithm that you should use in your programs? Or is it only good for Bitcoin? Well, watch the next video and we'll talk about that.